be introducing the uh, panelists today, Dan Lips of the Heritage Foundation, Joel Klein, whom you saw earlier, unable to restrain the mayor from speaking too long. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Smith, the uh, Commissioner of Education for the State of Florida, and Roy Romer, former governor of Colorado and former school superintendent in Los Angeles Unified School District. So we will welcome Rick Hess and the panelists. And after we, we're beginning a little late, we will run a little late. If uh, some of you absolutely have to leave at the scheduled time, we'll give you a break between the panel and the Q&A. Okay. Hey, thank you, Bob. Um, and in fact, uh, we'll see how it goes. I, I think uh, all the panelists uh, recognizing uh, that you guys are the hearty band who've seen this thing all the way through uh, are going to try to keep their remarks, uh, their opening remarks, relatively brief, uh, just hitting the key points. That should give us some time for a Q&A. And uh, given the fact that folks have travel arrangements and other commitments, I think we're going to try to end, you know, very close, if not uh, on the dot at 3.15. Uh, so please don't worry about getting stranded in here and having to try to sneak for the door at the last minute. Uh, I'm Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'm uh, moderating this panel. I'm going to open by uh, just making about eight or nine minutes. Uh, I was asked to just do a uh, couple quick remarks, just putting, uh, situating us a bit in terms of the accountability conversation. Uh, then I'm going to turn it over to uh, the distinguished panel. Uh, speaking first uh, will be uh, New York City Schools Chancellor Joel Klein. Speaking second will be Florida Education Commissioner Eric Smith. Speaking third uh, will be Chairman of uh, Strong American Schools in Edin 08, uh, former LA School Superintendent and former Governor of Colorado, Roy Romer. And speaking fourth uh, will be uh, Heritage Foundation's uh, ACE Education Analyst, uh, the widely published Dan Lips. Um, each of them is going to take about eight to ten minutes to hit their key points, and uh, at that juncture we'll open it up for conversation. Uh, Bob will have a mic, so you guys won't have to shout too hard. All right, when we talk about accountability in education, let's just talk, make sure we're situated in terms of the conversation we're having. Generally, when we talk about accountability in any line of work, education or anything else, what we're trying to argue for is a real straightforward, implicit bargain. We know that people tend to do their best work when they have the opportunity to exercise ingenuity, when the opportunity to make a difference, when they have the opportunity to do their best work. Unfortunately, when we want to make sure that people don't uh, mess up, when we want to make sure that they're giving an honest day's work, we also have to find some way to establish a floor to regulate what they're doing. Historically, through the middle of the 20th century, through the late 20th century in education, we did this by writing rules. We wrote rules about how frequently you had to buy new textbooks, about how many children could be in a classroom, about uh, the kinds of seating arrangements that were appropriate, about how we were going to compensate employees, about how schools were going to operate. That is what we call an input or compliance driven model of regulation. We try to ensure a minimal level of quality by making sure that everybody's doing the right procedures. Uh, you know, uh, certainly into the 1970s, this is the way a lot of American enterprises operated, and it made a fair bit of sense. If you didn't have good ways to measure whether or not people were doing a good job, and we're talking about the public's children, and we're talking about taxpayer dollars, you want to have some way to ensure that the quality work, or at least minimal quality work, is being done. Well, today, of course, in a variety of sectors, and increasingly in education, we have data. And the argument for accountability is that if you can judge people by the results they're producing, if you can hold them responsible for the work at the end of the day, you don't need to write all the rules and regulations. You don't need all the red tape as to how they need to go about their work. So that's really the crew of the accountability conversation. Can we find ways to judge school districts and schools and educators on the work they do so that we can give them the flexibility and opportunity to do that work in the way that they see best? This is not unique to education. Uh, for instance, the Gore Commission under President Clinton uh, talked extensively and, uh, and worked uh, pretty avidly across government to reinvent government. Exactly the same conversation. How can we shift from an input compliance model to an output model? Well, whether we're talking about reinventing government or education, accountability has got three key elements. It's true across the world, not unique to education. One, you've got to figure out what is the work that you're trying to do. Are you try, if you're running a department of motor vehicles, what are the expectations in terms of how fast you're going to help customers, and what are you trying to make sure happens? When it comes to school, generally it's what are we trying to make sure that children are learning? Once you've got your standards in place, you've got to figure out how are we going to measure performance? How are we going to assess on them? And third, 
Any accountability regime then requires that we have consequences. We've got to find ways to reward and encourage those who are doing great work, and we've got to find ways to take measures regarding those who are doing unacceptable work. Now, when we think about No Child Left Behind, for instance, in terms of these relatively simple models of accountability, the problem immediately becomes clear. No Child Left Behind, in some ways, I think, has been very useful, primarily in terms of casting enormous transparency and sunlight on what's going on in American education. The problem with the key intellectual problem with NCLB is that it basically takes three different accountability systems, tries to weld them together, and then just hopes that things are going to kind of work out. That rarely happens. The first model, what NCLB does best, is it gives us an x-ray of where our children are at at the end of the year. It lets us know by ethnic subgroups, by income, by English language status, by grade level, by district and school across the country. We know more about how our children are performing in reading and math and science today than we ever have in the history of this country. Problem, though, is that there's a second model of accountability, which is on its own terms very effective, which is that we look at professionals who are doing their work well and reward them, and professionals who are not doing their work well, and we take appropriate measures. Problem is that whether or not a child has proficiency at the end of the year doesn't necessarily tell us whether professionals are doing their jobs well. Whether or not a child is at proficiency at the end of the year is a product of three things. What the child has learned that year, what the child has learned in school every previous year, and everything else in that child's life. In other words, if you get a child who comes to you four or five grade levels behind in eighth grade, you could actually be an outstanding teacher. You could move that student two or three grade levels in terms of reading or math, and the student still is not going to be deemed proficient. This is particularly a problem because the third element of No Child Left Behind is that we have chosen to use the federal podium as a way to exhort for aggressive and impressive and ambitious targets in terms of educational proficiency, 100% proficiency across the board in 2014, which means that this other disjuncture between the X-ray and behavior modification has become a bigger problem. Well, what has this resulted in? Real simply, if you look at the left, uh, you see Massachusetts, for instance, tells you that about 48% uh, of its state kids are proficient uh, in fourth grade reading, and the federal NAEP tells you about 44% of kids are proficient. Massachusetts is an outlier in this way. A whole lot more states look like Tennessee or Mississippi. Mississippi will tell you that 88% of its kids are proficient. The federal NAEP will tell you that 19% of its kids are proficient. Somebody's mislabeling two out of three kids in Mississippi. This is exactly the kind of problem that results when we come up with incoherent accountability systems. One way to think about this is uh, there's a wonderful Fordham Foundation report uh, last year called the Proficiency Illusion. If you look at the left, you look at Colorado or Wisconsin on grade eight reading, for instance, you see that in order to be deemed proficient in reading in Colorado or Wisconsin, you've got to be at the 12th percentile nationally. If you're better than 11% of kids in your cohort, you are proficient in Wisconsin or Colorado. Go to the other end of the graph, if you're in South Carolina, if you, you've got to be at the 71st percentile nationally to be deemed proficient on the South Carolina reading test. So what happens is states are coming up with vastly different expectations, and the states that are trying to set a high bar are being punished under the logic of No Child Left Behind, which is probably exactly the wrong way we want to go about encouraging states to do the right thing. Another problem with the No Child Left Behind catch-all, when we think about AYP, if you look at, if you look, say, using the Florida data here, to in terms of schools that make AYP versus those that don't make AYP. Under NCLB, you see that on reading and math, AYP schools do about 7 to 9% better in terms of the gains students are making. On the other hand, if you look here on Florida's accountability system, which is focused on growth rather than levels of performance, you see that the difference between A schools and F schools uh, is more like 20 to 25%. So the Florida system, which is focused more on growth, is doing a far better job of identifying schools that are actually moving kids forward at an impressive rate. Frankly, if you look on the right side of this chart here, you see that in No Child Left Behind, about 30% of schools that make AYP are actually seeing smaller gains in Florida than schools that didn't make AYP. When you look, say, at Florida A versus F, those error rates drop to about 4 or 5% instead of 30%. Finally. I don't mean any of this to be inter interpreted as critical of accountability. I think accountability is an enormously powerful lever for educational improvement, but it's got to be done thoughtfully. What am, why am I confident that it's a powerful lever? Well, if we look up here, if we look at, uh, say, the uh, central uh, exam, if we look at the TIMSS data, uh, trends in international mathematics and science performance, uh, you see that nations that have strong central exams tend to outperform by about 
45 to 46 percent countries that don't have strong central exams when it comes to both science and mathematics. Not only that, but when countries have accountability systems in place, they're much more likely to make that input-output trade-off. When you have central exams, you're much more likely to give schools budget autonomy, and you're much more likely to give your principals salary autonomy. So for those of us who believe in decentralization and market forces, having transparency and strong central accountability systems is a very useful lever. Internationally, consistently, it's associated with more decentralization and more flexibility when it comes to salary. Anyway, with that, let me just sit on down, and I'm going to turn it over to the Chancellor. Thank you. You know, I feel like since this panel started late, we're sort of in New York and we're talking at warped speed. So uh, I'm not going to take more time, but I'm going to try to see if we can slow down uh, the pace a little bit. I, I actually think that uh, Rick hit on a lot of the fundamental points, and I just want to kind of underscore a few of the ones I think are critical. I always like to start, though, with this speech from Al Shanker, because when people tell me the unions don't get it, I just want you to know Al Shanker got it. And we should remind people that he understood these key points. In this speech, which some of you heard me quote from yesterday, he starts with what I think is the most insightful view of what's going on in education. And he says, see, the key in public education is that unless there is accountability, we will never get the right system. As long as there are no consequences, if kids or adults don't perform, if kids or adults don't perform, as long as the discussion is not about education and student outcomes, remember what Rick said, this is not about inputs, this is about outcomes, then we're playing a game as to who has the power. Unless you start with a very heavy emphasis on accountability, not end with it, you'll never get a system where all the other pieces fall into play. That's my story. And for the past six years in New York, we stuck to it. Fundamentally, we immediately began to move beyond NCLB. I, I give President Bush a lot of credit. I give uh, the bipartisan legislation a lot of credit. But Rick is right. There are a lot of problems with it. On the other hand, it put accountability on the national playing field. But it was accountability 1.0. And we immediately went to work on a different accountability system to address many of the issues that Rick is talking about. So what we did was fundamentally cluster schools in our city that start at the same place. And Mayor mentioned this. What I mean by start at the same place, their kids in the fourth grade are basically performing similarly to each other, or in the fifth grade, or in the third grade. And fundamentally, we look at how much they move the kid forward, not just to get to proficiency, but you look at each kid, are you moving them forward or backward? In our city under NCLB, we've got a four tier, one, two, three, four, four the best, one the worst. In my view, if you move a kid from a low two to a high two, that's great work. But under NCLB, you get zero credit for it. In my view, much of what NCLB measures is what the kid brings to the school. Kid comes in at a level four, and the school takes him to a level three, and NCLB says, you're proficient, bingo. And Checker Finn just came out a report on this where you don't get credit. So we take our highest performing schools and still look how many level threes they move to level four. If some of them are doing it, all of them should be doing it. And we base this accountability system such that we aggregate both how you do vis-a-vis -vis your cohort and how you do vis-a-vis -vis the city. And in that way, it's apples to apples. That is the issue of how our state does in comparison to NAEP for our schools since they're all taking the same test. If one school is moving their kids forward by a half a percentage point and the other is moving backward that on the same test, that's a real apples to apples comparison. Second thing we do is we survey everybody. And that counts for 10% of the report. And last year we had 600,000. This year we'll probably have several hundred thousand more. Last year, we had 25% of our parents. This year, we're targeting to get 40% of our parents. Other than the census, the largest survey. And we ask them what they think of their school, their kids' education, and that gets rolled up into the progress report. And the third thing we do is we give people what we call a quality review, bring in an outside group, not so different from the British inspectorate, and they analyze how the school does its work. And that report 
gets published. So you've got fundamentally a survey, the progress report, and a qualitative rather than a quantitative assessment. And all three of these things for any one of our schools you can find on the web. And when we get, when we get the scores, we give you an A, B, C, D, or F, just like in Florida. And I always thought that's where Governor Bush and I bonded because I, I don't get this cine stuff. And I also don't get this sort of bimodal distribution. You're either a cine or you're an ace. Well, uh, you know. Chancellor, what's cine just for those who? What's cine? I purposely don't want to tell them because I don't know what it is. I never understood. It means school in need of improvement. But you know, they call it a cine. So, you know, I asked the parents, I said, you know, you, you, your kid goes to a cine school. They said, well, I, I didn't know we had religious schools in the city. And, you know, I mean, what, you know, if you don't speak in plain tongue to people, and if you obfuscate, then you dilute the accountability. Sure, it's very noisy in our city when I put an A on a school and I put an, uh, a B on a neighboring school that people thought was equally good. But that's what meaningful accountability. Now, we've got to move it beyond math and English language arts to include science, social studies, and a whole bunch of other things. That's part of our evolution. And then following on that, real consequences and real useful tools. You see, if my school started the same as your school, and I move my kids, but you're not moving yours, if you're smart, you and several of your teachers, you come to my school and figure out what I'm doing. And that's the way people learn in our city. They cluster together. We put in place these interim assessments and predictive assessments so that our teachers have data and information so that they can then say, this is how I'm going to move the kids forward. And they start early. You know, knowledge is empowering to teachers. Our accountability system is rolled up and will be available next year to all of our teachers, the data on the kids. It's not just a gotcha game for the city and the state and the federal government. It's actually a tool that helps schools do their work better. And they've all created inquiry teams. One of my assistant principals sitting up here, and we were talking before about how powerful that inquiry team, where there's group ownership at the school for the kid. It's no longer the teacher and 25 kids. It's a cohort of teachers and three or 400 kids. And they're putting their collective heads together to get the work done. So it's become empowering. But yes, there are real consequences. I've got an agreement with every principal in New York City that if their school gets two Fs or an, uh, Fs and Ds, after two years, automatically I terminate them. After four years, I shut the school down. I can do it earlier if I want to, but they sign that in return for an agreement on empowerment. And that's been a real trade, not too dissimilar to what charters are about, moving from an input-driven, non-accountable model to an output-driven, accountable and empowering model for school leaders, and it's had real impact. Our principals can make up to $50,000 a year based on the nature of the assignment they take on if we think they're good and the results they get. They meet their targets on their prior. Every school every year gets a target of how much progress that school is expected to make. Our teachers, as the mayor said, get an additional $3,000 per teacher in 200 of our highest need schools if they meet their target. So it's a system that has robust consequences. Kids in an F school have a transfer right in the city of New York, and they can transfer out of their F schools if they want to. And F schools will be closed. The hardest thing in public education often is to close schools because they become part of a community. But if you don't close dysfunctional schools, and one of the things that NCLB hasn't been aggressive enough on, if you don't close dysfunctional schools and you go through this constant trying to upgrade them, what you end up finding out is you're really in a deck chair rearranging exercise. Last point to address the important point that Rick raised, and I realize, like a lot of things, this is not on the immediate horizon, but I predict you someday we're going to have to get there, and that is the way to deal meaningfully with accountability in the United States is to have national standards and national assessments. We are in this together, folks, and one of the things that drives me nuts, in some states you can have a graduation rate that's a one and a half times a neighboring state that reflects nothing about the quality of education and everything about the requirements in order to graduate. And we don't even think that we're disserving our kids by getting them out of high school wholly unprepared for college. One of the things we're doing now in New York is looking at a data system that goes through grade 16. 
because I'm not doing my kids a service by simply pushing them over the finish line and not getting them ready for the challenges that are going to be ahead. If we had national standards, they would be rigorous, and in, if we had national assessments, they would be far more sophisticated than 50 states each doing their own things. And then we could have the kind of dynamic accountability system that Rick and others have proposed, and that I must say I give the governor great credit for what he did here in Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Thank you very much. A little bit cozy up here and a little bit dangerous, too. I worry about the far end of the table not falling off as you try to get out, to the, close this thing out this afternoon. I honor to be here with you all this afternoon and uh, uh, pleased to have everyone here in Florida. Uh, the first issue I'd, I'd make about, about accountability is courage, that uh, accountability takes extraordinary courage to get into an accountability program and live it through and develop it and, 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 and build it up. And, uh, blessed this afternoon to have two of our, our uh, state board chair people that have, have been involved in that, T. Willard Fair, chairman of the state board in the back, and Kathleen Shanahan, both that have, have lived this process. I kind of inherited it. I'm, I'm the lucky guy. I just get to, to look at some of the good data that's coming in as a result uh, of this. Uh, the work here in Florida predated uh, No Child Left Behind. I think one of the great virtues of an accountability program, and this is a virtue as good as any of the outcomes that might be as it requires the organization, the system, be it a school district or a state organization or a national organization to clarify its values, what is important to it. And it, no accountability system makes sense without the organization, the leadership, uh, uh, making it clear as to what is important and what is valued and what is ascribed value in the process of accounting and, and measuring. Uh, we've done that here in the state of Florida. We've, we've done that through our accountability system. As a result, we've been able to make very clear uh, two incredibly important issues that we value as a state. And one is that of equity, that we believe all children, regardless of background, walk of life, region, rural, urban, suburban, that all of our children in the state of Florida deserve a high quality education and that we're going to hold all of us accountable to that outcome. The second piece is that all of our children are, uh, deserve the right to a solid foundation in education so they can take advantage of the rest of the opportunities available to them uh, pre-K through 12 and beyond. But the clarity of work is important because so much of what you read about in, in the quote school reform notion in America talks about the adult issue, what I call the adult issues, the governance issues that will spend millions in litigation and uh, moving of the chairs and the classroom teachers continue to come to class and do the very best they can and go home at the end of the day and nothing has changed in the classroom. Accountability, if it is, if it is a good accountability system, will understand, understand the work of classroom teachers and understand how clarification of that work for a classroom teacher can make the job more doable, more satisfying, and more successful. So the ability to drive through an accountability program, clarity of work, I think, uh, brings many values, uh, one of which is, is direct implications on what transpires and takes place uh, in, in the classroom and in the classroom level. Uh, work by teachers individually, and very important, work, work by teams of teachers within schools that are, that are focused on achieving the targets and the goals and, and the outcomes uh, that are reflected in, in the accountability program. The second major uh, element uh, is transparency. Here in Florida, we uh, have been grading our schools for uh, a, a good number of, of years, and uh, that school grading process uh, is, is the right thing to do. Uh, mom and dad understand an A school and an F school. They understand that. It's not, uh, it's not some other language or perhaps even religion. Uh, it is, it is, uh, it is, is clarity to it. And they can make uh, judgments and decisions about their sons and daughters based on that clarity. So uh, the transparency of what is going on in the classroom rather than the folklore coming out of the PTA meeting uh, or faculty meeting uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is incredibly important to uh, our customers and, and our consumers. Uh, here in Florida, we've uh, been blessed with, with incredible results. And again, as, as a relatively new commissioner to the state, um, I've uh, been, been greeted with numerous uh, reports, national reports, and I, I would, re would, would share some of this, these statistics that the, the impact, and I, I, I ascribe this uh, 
largely to uh, Florida's commitment over the last decade to establishing an aggressive and solid uh, accountability program uh, has resulted in national measures that have shown our, our, our growth and, and performance. Uh, Florida is one of only four states this uh, last year uh, recognized in, in the report Quality Counts, uh, one of only four states in the nation to improve significantly in both fourth and eighth grade reading. Uh, we are one of only three states in the union uh, to have showed great gains in fourth grade math and achievement and one of only, uh, one of only seven states in the union that have, uh, uh, have uh, 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 had shown significant improvement in eighth grade mathematics. Uh, we have continued to close the achievement gap between uh, uh, whites and minority students. In fact, uh, Florida is one of only five states uh, that have showed a significant narrowing of the white and African American achievement gap between 2003 and 2007 in fourth grade reading and one of only seven states to do so in the same uh, uh, for eighth grade mathematics. Uh, the uh, uh, NAEP results in uh, writing have also shown a significant increase uh, for the state of Florida and again I, I hold that to uh, this state's decision to make writing a part of its accountability program and part of what we measure. Uh, overall uh, ranking uh, in NAEP continues to go up for the state and other measures as well that I think are important. Uh, the, the measure of quality counts uh, that was recently released this spring uh, also measures uh, AP performance. Uh, measures at the, at the top end of the scale and Florida ranks uh, fourth in the nation in the uh, percent of graduates that have successfully completed at least one advanced placement course. We rank number one in the nation in the number of African Americans that have successfully completed at least one AP program before graduation and first in the nation in the number of Hispanic Latino students that have graduated with uh, successfully completing at least one AP uh, course as well. I uh, attribute these kinds of, this kind of success to a focus on what this state values, what educators value, and what teachers and administrators across the state uh, have been capable in, in delivering. I think the challenge for us, and again what uh, Florida is currently engaged in, is defining the next generation of accountability that we have shown strong progress in establishing a foundation for learning. Establishing a foundation isn't good enough. Establishing a foundation will not guarantee admissions of a, your son or daughter to a, a, a selective university or to a state four-year university. A solid foundation means that you have the fundamental reading and math skills to perform in our society, but does not mean that you are prepared to enter the workforce that, you, that these young people will be engaged in. It is incumbent on America, it's incumbent on our states and our cities to begin to uh, develop uh, what I, again, would term the next generation of accountability, which is the definition of work around the upper edge. How do we define the work at the higher end and how do we bring a representative population of all of our students to work at that highest level? Uh, here in the state of Florida, we've just enacted this last year, uh, a, a last session, a, a, a new uh, high school accountability program which will ascribe 50% of the foundational score, the, the FCAT score, our, our historical work, uh, to the school grade for high schools. The other half is going to be uh, a combination of AP performance and enrollment, IB performance and enrollment, uh, dual enrollment performance and enrollment, uh, industry certification, enrollment and completion, graduation rate across the board and graduation rate for the bottom quartile in grade nine. Those factors will be added to our accountability to give a definition and expectation that schools will not only prepare the students and guarantee to mom and dad that they're performing at the lowest level, at the foundational level, but they were, were pulling more and more students to performance at that high level. I think uh, much is uh, 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 ahead of America in our work around accountability, but without that clarity of focus on what you expect educators to do, what you expect our schools to do, uh, we will not uh, be able to achieve any of the outcomes that are essential. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Governor. Um, I, Rachel, keep me on eight minutes, okay? Um, <laughs> there is um, so much that has been said that is valuable, beginning with uh, Mayor Bloomberg. I, I, there's a very good illustration of, of accountability. 
I want to pick one element of this, and it is the how do we bring this to a nation? Um, my colleague Joel said we eventually need national standards and national assessments. I want to give you a way to get there. I started this about 15 years ago when I co-chaired uh, with another governor, the original standards uh, uh, committee. Um, we, we have a wonderful opportunity. We got an election for president. Bear with me with this analogy. Imagine you being the next president of the United States. Within 30 days, I want you to call in to the East Room of the White House, 50 governors and 50 state school officers. And I want you as president to challenge them to be partners in a new way. We've got to go beyond, leave no child behind. And we've got to arrive at more uh, consensual agreement on standards. We really do need national standards. Politically, I don't think we can legislate them, nor do I think it is probably the best way to get there. But we can get there another way, this way. The president says these 50 states, in 90 days, I want 15 of you back in this East Room and having agreed to a model set of standards for K-12 education, which are benchmarked against the 10 best performing nations in the world. That is crucial, that you say to the states, you have got to voluntarily say how good is good enough, and your standard uh, has got to be what the world is now performing. And so the president says, you do that. And they're already working on this through Achieve. But a president could incentivize this in the following way. You do that. You do it voluntarily. Come back in 90 days. You bring that to the table. Agree to commit to that and implement it in your states. Here's what I will get Congress to bring as incentive. One, we will bring money to pay for the design of your tests. And you will do the design. But it is crucial, if you're going to be accountable, to get the right kind of exams. Secondly, we will pay for the administration of those tests, because that is a very great burden in, in accountability. Three, uh, you could add some other incentive packages that we will have in there a bundle of money to make it transparent, like New York is doing in the hands of parents. And even four, you might put into that as an incentive an aggressive program on teaching. But you say, as the president, this is available to those of you who take this and agree to commit to it over a period of years. And then you say to the other 50 states, you can join in this. This is a voluntary action. We're going to do this for a couple of years. We're going to assess it. And we're going to file it as a, as a, as a, a pilot. And then we'll see where we take next steps. If you get educators who say, and you start only with math and language arts, don't get into the rest of the, of the first step. And you say to a group, if you find in the math area that you've got a math war, that you think there are two ways you have to go, get two groups of 15. I'll do the same with a second group and let them lay their evidence on the table after two or three years. But the key to this is a political judgment. I've watched the candidates for president and other candidates in national elections. They are hesitant to go to Iowa and say, let me tell you how to run your schools. You all know why. It doesn't fit. But a president can go to Iowa and say, you, Iowa, Colorado, and others have agreed to reach this level so that your youngsters can compete in the next 10, 20 years with the world. You have agreed that this is how good is good enough. I, as president, want to bring to the table tools to help you get there resources to help you get there. That is politically acceptable. Iowa will say, right on. But they will not say right on to, we want to take over your schools. So we need to find a mechanism of partnering with states, which gets over that hurdle of states' rights. And I think the key to it is international benchmarking. Now, you can alter this package, but I put it on the table in the accountability discussion. Because we simply can't get there from here with 50 different states setting 50 different standards. And I think the charts that everybody put on the wall indicate that. And so if you can't get there, I'd love to take the route that Joel mentioned, and that is just legislate it. And you may have to do that. 
But I think politically it is much more acceptable in America to do it in this voluntary way, but with sufficient incentives and with short enough timelines that it really begins to bite. So I want to throw that out as a conversation that we ought to have in this presidential campaign. Now, it's not just the standards, it is the assessments. And then again, I want to go back to where Joel was. We need not only national standards, but national assessments. Achieve Inc. is working now with states, about 11 or 12 of them, uh, on a common assessment for Algebra 2. That's so sensible. When I was in LA running the LA school system, it was crazy for me to pay high dollars to go out and design authentic tests for Algebra 2 alone. I should have been doing it with other states. And here's what it does when you do it together. It gives you protection. The governor of Colorado, the new one, is now just going through this problem. They are about to, to adopt new standards. Well, that governor, if he is standing with 15 others, and they have arrived at really a world-class standard in math, then he can go back to the 180 school districts in Colorado and say, you think you're criticizing me? I am with the best in the world, and I want the best for your children. This, the, the combination gives strength. So let me summarize. There is so much we need to work on to make this uh, system reform itself, and accountability is a very good tool. But accountability rests very largely on the quality of the test, the examination. And I, again, I want to close. I used this illustration yesterday. I used to train people to fly airplanes. And we would have tests. And if you have a test in terms of how to land a plane, that's a test that has real consequences. And, and you simply can teach to a test if the test truly measures what it is that you want the youngster to learn. And so the quality of the test is what concerned me the most when I was in L.A. for six years. I knew we had to have uh, the accountability. We had to have it frequently. And um, I just was worried, in math specifically, about what kind of questions were we were being asked. And you're being answered by the bubble because it's cheaper, when that's not quite the skill that I wanted people to acquire. So let me throw that out as a suggestion to help us get to accountability. Thank you, Governor. And uh, our last speaker will be uh, Dan Lips of the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. I think the only thing that more risky than sitting, sitting in that seat over there is to trying to follow all these very distinguished panelists that I'm so honored to be with today. I want to thank our uh, hosts here, the Foundation and the James Madison Institute, for being so kind uh, to bring me uh, to this conference. Uh, I, in the interest of time I, and uh, uh, hearing what's been said before, um, I'm going to try and condense my prepared remarks and just touch on the basic things that I hoped to convey today. I was asked to, to highlight some of the uh, research evidence and uh, lessons that can be drawn from our experience in accountability. And I'll, I'll plan to do that uh, uh, in a, uh, my brief time here. In his speech uh, this afternoon at lunch, uh, Mayor Bloomberg referenced the A Nation at Risk report. And it's, I think, uh, appropriate for us to be having this meeting today, uh, just shortly after the 25th anniversary of A Nation at Risk. And uh, as we all know, that report highlighted the many problems that we face in American education. And I think that we can all be very discouraged that many of those same problems remain today. Uh, but if anything has changed since A Nation at Risk was published back in 1983, it's been that we've seen the rise of the standards and accountability movement across the country. And today the idea of accountability is uh, commonplace in American education, and I believe it's ingrained in how parents conceive of how their schools should be uh, evaluated and measured. Uh, but after these 25 years, I think it's important for us to ask some questions about accountability. Has it worked? Has it effect been effective? And what lessons can be drawn? Uh, the first uh, question I think we should ask is, how effective has accountability been? And uh, Rick did a great job of summarizing uh, some of the basic uh, uh, ideas that we've learned. But I think it's important to, to, uh, us, for us to ask whether accountability has been effective. And in my view, it, it certainly has. But there should be some important cautions that we consider uh, when we think about accountability. 
We've seen that we, there many, there, over the past 25 years, there's been many effective accountability reforms uh, that have been put in place, and we've seen how accountability uh, can lift student uh, performance. But I think we've also seen some problems with accountability, and that not all accountability systems are created equal, and that uh, accountability as a, a reform strategy faces a number of uh, important obstacles. And I think it's safe to say that during this time when we've seen a real rise in accountability uh, in education, we haven't seen the major problems that were identified by a nation at risk solved. So why is that the case? I think, and this brings me to my second lesson that I'd like to convey, and this is something that, that Rick has done some terrific research on, is that accountability is really tough business. If, if you look at our experience over the past few decades, it's really hard to, to one, implement uh, strong accountability uh, reforms. I'm sitting, uh, standing here with uh, some of the great practitioners who are doing that terrific work, but as they'll tell you, they f you face uh, immense uh, practical and political obstacles to implement the kinds of accountability systems that we know will work. Um, so it, if you look at the trends, uh, due to these uh, problems, we see that accountability systems loosen and become weaker over time. And I fear that that's something that we're seeing in response to No Child Left Behind after six years, that some of these states are weakening their standards uh, due to these institutional pressures that we must be aware of. That said, uh, the third uh, point I'd like to make is that accountability is, is here to stay, and it's a great reform option, and we should do our best that we can to study what works and uh, look at the best models. We're, we're on the cusp of a lot of great innovations in accountability, the kinds of things that they're talking about in New York, where you can uh, hone in on uh, student performance year over year and uh, teacher quality and uh, tying accountability to other impor important reforms to improve our schools. Uh, I also think that uh, the acceptance of accountability and parents becoming accustomed to the idea of transparency in public education could help uh, change the balance, change some of the political dynamics that have made accountability so tough to achieve over the past few decades. Uh, that said, I, I think that it really is important for us to look at the best models and uh, coming to Florida, I think we've done it, uh, we found the right spot because uh, in my view, no place has done a, as uh, a successful work in the uh, area of accountability than Florida. I recently finished a paper with uh, Dr. Matthew Ladner of the Goldwater Institute reviewing the, the types of education reforms that have been put in place over the past uh, 10 years since Governor Bush uh, took office in the late 1990s. And when Matt and I started looking at the numbers, um, as Commissioner, Commissioner Smith pointed out, what Florida has accomplished over the past decade is simply remarkable. Um, I, I won't uh, repeat all the statistics, but they've seen dramatic gains in, uh, across the board on the NAEP at all levels and all students' backgrounds. Uh, in, uh, something that jumped out to Matt and I was that uh, disadvantaged kids and ethnic minority students uh, in Florida are outperforming uh, the statewide averages in many states. And uh, Hispanic students in Florida are outper outperforming uh, statewide averages in more than a dozen states. It's really remarkable what, what we've seen here. And I think it's important to ask what, uh, what caused the, that remarkable improvement. And uh, I won't try to, uh, there's, Commissioner Smith and others here know a lot more about what happened, but I think for our discussion about accountability, I'd like to, sh to share what I think is really impressive about Florida's effort. And that is, uh, the first lesson is that they implemented a really broad conception of accountability. Beyond, beyond the things that uh, we've been talking about with testing and uh, 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 establishing standards and public reporting, uh, they've gone a lot further than that. They're holding students accountable by ending social promotion. Uh, I think that that is a terrific uh, and a driving force in lifting these uh, reading and test scores uh, that we've seen on the NAEP. Uh, beyond holding students accountable, uh, parents can hold their schools accountable with some of the most aggressive uh, school choice reforms that we've seen in the nation. I think it's important to keep school choice into this accountability uh, discussion. And last, as, as has been mentioned, uh, they're also uh, holding teachers accountable uh, through the uh, introduction of some merit pay and performance pay type reforms. So I think it's important to use this broad conception of accountability, not just the standards and testing, but the, uh, the whole cocktail of reforms that have been implemented in Florida uh, should be a model for the rest of the country. And it sounds like uh, many of the same things are happening uh, in uh, New York, which is so encouraging. Uh, the second lesson that I see in Florida, as has been uh, already said, is 
uh, the, the, the importance of maintaining political will. It really does take incredible leadership, and I'm just awed by what Governor Bush and Commissioner Smith and so many others have been able to accomplish in this state. Uh, to close with just one final point, um, and I think I'll probably differ than some of the, the panelists here, I think that it's helpful to look at the Florida example, and, and for those of us who follow federal policy, to compare what's happened with No Child Left Behind and what types of accountability uh, reforms have been implemented from Washington. And when you compare what's happened in Florida, they've really been able to overcome those major obstacles that, uh, that Rick and others have identified uh, by maintaining political will and by uh, really uh, implementing what, uh, in my view, is almost the spirit of No Child Left Behind, all of these reforms that have been so successful. We compare Florida's experience with what we've seen from No Child Left Behind, uh, some of the poor implementation, the types of things that Rick identified at the beginning of this discussion with uh, really the, the uh, hybrid approach uh, that uh, is the result of the, the sausage making of uh, policy that we have on Capitol Hill. Uh, when you compare the, the implementation and the unintended consequences that we've seen, I think there's a great risk as we move forward uh, that states are going to be continuing to lower their standards in response to the 2014 deadline. Uh, I think that we should be cautious to think that there's a shortcut uh, to getting past the really hard work that Florida has accomplished. Uh, through Washington. So I would caution against the national standards and uh, putting too much power in D.C. But with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all again for having me and uh, look forward to hearing from our panelists. Thanks, Dan. Well, I'd just like to thank the panelists for an unbelievably uh, terse set of uh, really interesting and really thoughtful remarks. Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, with that, that actually gives us about 25 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, Bob will uh, have the mic. Um, I would just ask that folks please do us the favor of identifying yourselves by names and affiliation for those in the room who might not know you. And I would ask, as always, that questions actually be questions. Uh, we sometimes start to uh, speechify from the floor and uh, lose our way. Uh, if we get 20, 25 seconds in and we don't see a question anywhere in sight, I'll just uh, ask you to give back the mic and we'll give somebody else a chance. Uh, with that, why don't we go ahead and open it up? And, yes, sir. Uh, we're recording. That's why we ask you to use the mic. And back, here. Uh, back there is a gentleman against the wall. A lady in the back row. <laughs> or gentleman. I'm Susan Story, and I'm a president and CEO of Gulf Power here in Florida. Um, we've heard a lot about accountability and what we need to do in education. Um, a lot of us believe that businesses need to be a lot more involved in the whole education process and be part of the accountability instead of just kind of pushing off and saying, go deliver us workers who can do this. Um, for each, for some of the panelists, if you'd like to respond, what do you think the role of business is in ensuring that we move forward in this area, an era of accountability competition and make sure that we have the people we need for the future to work in our companies? Commissioner? There, there, there are two issues. Uh, one, business needs to needs to play a, a critical role in helping to define uh, what the future is going to look like for our children and what we should be preparing them for. So there, there should be some uh, some very clear and, and systematic process for 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 surfacing that that expectation. Uh, and uh, business certainly has a, a has a, a very important role in helping to, to inform that about the you know the about the, the future work need uh, the uh, preparation need the, the kind of kind of education is going to be required to to meet uh, uh, the future uh, education uh, expectations within our, our workplace is is one where, where the business community needs to play a critical role and uh, the other the other element of that yeah, I think is, is, a, is a real good clear look at the at the demographics of, of who is in our, our who are in our schools today and what is the current level of output of our K-12 community colleges and four-year universities in terms of volume? Uh, are we preparing uh, a large enough quantity of kids uh, and young, young adults to, to graduate and be prepared to enter our workforce uh, with, with high, skill, high skill status? So I think there's a combination for the, work, for the business place to be involved uh, to help guide and shape that discussion about uh, the future economic development in our nation and what competitiveness, international competitiveness uh, looks like and what skills are going to be required, uh, a, as well as a, an understanding of, of the children that we're here to serve in, in the process. Uh, and I, if I could, just one last, last element. 
Um, I think we, uh, we still tend to be trapped in the past in terms of what we expect our kids to do. We spend a lot of time talking about reading and math and it's still uh, tied to a textbook and tied to a paper and pencil. And uh, there is, uh, as you, if you lift your sights up and start thinking about accountability on the upper edge, the upper edge of accountability, what is, what is truly going to be the workplace and the kind of environment that young people from all backgrounds and walks of life, uh, ha what are they going to have to be able to do in order to compete? I think there's, there's a whole new definition of, of, of readiness that uh, educators, that those in the, in, the, in the business of education need to uh, take, some, take some good hard lessons about uh, to, to better understand what we're preparing our young people for. A quick comment on that. First of all, I think business has got to prioritize this issue. Sure, next year's environmental standards or tax breaks uh, are important, but business has really got to bring urgency to this. The second thing, and, and, and Dan makes a lot of good political points about national standards, but it's always seemed to me for every state like Florida or Massachusetts, there are lots of other states that are in a race for the bottom uh, and that you give everybody cover. And at least in my vision, the two key groups that ought to be designing those standards and those assessments are our colleges, our top universities, and the business community. Those are the customers for my kids. And I'd like to know what they think my kids need, not some people sitting in a room by themselves disconnected. Yes, sir. Mark Ott's Educational Facility Solutions uh, here in Florida. Uh, to Chancellor Klein, uh, listening to Mayor Bloomberg today talk about empowering principals, empowering teachers, uh, that is the system that works, and I congratulate you for clearing the smoke away and getting that uh, into place in New York. And I think over the long term, 10 years, you'll, be, you'll show real, real well. But my question is, you have one of the largest budgets regarding per student uh, uh, cost or, or dollars per student. How much of that budget does the principal actually get to control and have discretion over? It's a good question, and he, there are two answers to it. In a real sense now, out of approximately $20 billion, pensions, all the other things, about eight and a half, nine billion dollars $9 is in the school budget. And most of that, but not all of that, most of that is taken up by teachers. And so in one sense, you don't have nearly as much discretion, although it's 10x, even with the teacher factor, what it was when we started. But and one of the things we're doing, and we're taking a lot of political heat on this, is I, I believe whether you have a little lower class size or an after-school program or a different enrichment program, I believe that the schools should make those decisions. And what you see now, in a literal sense, the principal has control of 90% of his budget because he can hire two fewer teachers and decide to create a Saturday academy. And some of that gets swapped out. I don't want to kid you, there's enormous political pushback on it, but my view is that's a residue or a legacy of the old input-driven system, and the more we focus on results and the less we worry about how people navigate their way to it, we'll be a lot better off. Okay. Yes. I had a question for Chancellor Klein. Uh, the mayor and you have both mentioned the generous rewards for excellent teachers. Uh, what are the consequences for bad teachers and what is the rubber room? <laughs> yeah, the rubber room is a place where we, we put teachers, it's, this is an example of how nutty the thing is. So if you're alleged to have physically or sexually abused a kid or really done something that's over the line and in a system like that, uh, like ours sadly it occurs, we take you out of the classroom and we have to pay you until the arbitration ends, which could take a couple of years. All the incentives are totally misaligned. I, I propose saying, we'll pay you if, if we took you out erroneously, we'll give you back pay at 1.4x or whatever so that we compensate you. But as long as you create a system in which people have an incentive to stay on the payroll, believe me, they figure out a way uh, to do it. The other thing we, we try to do, and this is a political hard knocks lesson, we, we've developed a very sophisticated teacher accountability system. We look at value add for our teachers, and it's big. I mean, there are great differences that we discern. 
and we wanted to use that as one of multi-factored uh, tenure analysis, and the union went to Albany and basically uh, put, put a stop to it. That's a big mistake. Any parent would want that information. It should be totally transparent, uh, and it should drive change in the system. We'd like to believe all teachers are great, and most of our teachers are, are good, but I want to tell you, there are some people there who shouldn't be teaching my kids, and if they're not teaching my kids, they shouldn't be teaching your kids. Okay. Uh, in the back, I guess. Hi, my name is Jim Gunner, and I'm with Central Michigan University. I also chair the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. Um, question to Chancellor Klein. With that, what you just referenced in New York and going to Albany and getting essentially law passed where you can't evaluate teachers based on student performance, do you see a similar type of push to not be able to evaluate schools based on student performance? No because I think the politics uh, are different on that. Although you certainly see a push today in Washington for people, for example, to uh, repeal NCLB. There's a bill pending right now. You see people, and the Secretary talked about this yesterday, trying to dilute the accountability. I was actually encouraged by Dan's comments that he thinks accountability is here to stay. In my view, accountability is in its early phases. We've got to ratchet it up significantly, but I'm at the same time worried about the pushback that's going on at the national level to dilute what I think is a relatively weak current accountability system. Dan, you follow this stuff at the national level. Um, in terms of both the, the upcoming election and also in terms of developments of the states, you know, can you speak a bit more broadly to uh, Joel's point here about the way that the politics of school accountability are developing? Sure. I, I think that uh, I agree that, that many of the states are bad actors, and I think that it does take, uh, I guess, a bit of realism and a leap of faith to look and trust the states to, to be our best hope for uh, implementing strong accountability. Um, I, I do think that uh, if trying to solve this from Washington is very difficult as we've seen how hard No Child Left Behind has been to uh, with the implementation and moving forward it's unclear I think where we'll be headed next year when uh, whoever's president I do think we'll see some dramatic changes to No Child Left Behind and uh, prob probably not from the better. Um, I've been supportive of a bill that's being supported by some conservative members in the Senate and the House that would really change the federal government's relationship to the states in terms of accountability. This is called the A-plus Act, which would basically bring a charter, uh, chartering approach to federal education policy by allowing states to have the kinds of aut autonomy and uh, empowerment that we've heard uh, talked about this weekend uh, in exchange for setting standards. And uh, let's have this laboratories of democracy approach where uh, Florida can compete with Mississippi and Massachusetts and uh, let's get the federal government and its incentives out of the way. Um, I, I think that may offer an attractive alternative to, to No Child Left Behind. Questions? Uh, right here. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Melissa Ayler from the Governor's Office in Texas. And I was wondering, there's been a lot of talk in this panel and, and throughout the conference about student improvement and growth measures, and I hope this isn't getting too um, in the minutia of accountability systems, but I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on whether there should be a balance between um, improvement and absolute proficiency standards or whether student improvement is sufficient. I think there has to be a balance. We have some balance in New York. We've got to keep our eyes on the prize here. By, by the same token, there's no way to get from where we are to proficiency without progress. It's the only road we can travel on. And while we shouldn't say that the kid made progress and he's still at a basic or below basic level, and that's just fine, but it's unrealistic to me to think that if you just put a line in the sand and say proficiency for everyone is the solution, that you're not going to have the kind of race to the bottom. And if you have progress, you'll get to proficiency as long as it's real progress. Commissioner? 
I just I add to that, you know, we're, as I said in my remarks, we're in the process of, of developing our, our next generation accountability for high schools and uh, we're working to, to give a definition to, to, to the, the more college ready uh, uh, requirements and, and work ready requirements. And uh, to implement those, uh, we're, we haven't settled on anything yet, but we're, we're going to have to take a real hard look at, at growth measures uh, with some schools that, that don't offer any of, of, of those opportunities for us young people. So again, we have to have some, uh, we, I think we have to be looking at, at growth over time. Governor? Um, I'm a, this is a delayed reaction I, I, uh, to the question that Dan just spoke about, about the possibility of the state chartering. Uh, I, I'm, I got an open mind on this, but I, I want to share with you. I don't have it visually, but visibly with me. But uh, uh, Education Week, just in the last uh, week or two, published a uh, map of the United States of uh, 15,000 districts and showed the graduation rates. I remember Colorado, we a different color, but we had a over 90 and a below 50, right side by side in Colorado, and and. It gets back to the point I raised, the point Dan raised. This is a great nation, but we have got to get a much more uniform and responsible educational policy for the whole nation, or you cannot move on the other agendas that are being talked about in this campaign. Singapore, for example, has an approach to education that every child has to learn. They need it. They don't have enough people in Singapore. They can't waste it. And so you need to think with us all how does this nation get its act together in education? It's competing with 30 industrial nations, all of which have a much more federalized system. I don't want to federalize education in this country. Therefore, one of the structural mechanisms is for us to look at governors and states as responsible pieces of this organization. If you look at Colorado, there's a 80, 180 school districts in Colorado that feel like that they're totally free to do whatever they want to do. And I don't think this nation can rely upon that degree of scattered uh, distribution of responsibility in education without some closer form of partnering. And so when Dan said charter may be one way to go, it may be with appropriate uh, accountability in the chartering aspect. But that's what I was trying to put on the table also. We have got to get somewhere very quickly, or else this nation economically is going to be a third world nation. And uh, in response to the question in terms of weighting uh, value added and level based accountability, Governor, do you have uh, feelings on that, on how those should be weighted? No, say it again. I was. Uh, in track. response to the question on how accountability systems ought to factor both uh, growth and levels of proficiency into play. Well, do you, I. Do you have, I think it ought to be based on a growth, but it ought to have um, a clear definition of how good is good enough. I mean, in LA, uh, we adopted very, very strict ultimate goals, but it was realistic that you had to bring that through a system that was very non-performing, and you have to deal with those human beings and give them, there has to be both. There's got to be an accountability, but you've got to give them credit for growth as you go. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, whichever of them catches your eye, Don Rocker. Following up on the last question and this comment about proficiency versus progress, has there any consideration been given to testing children both at the start and the end of the school year? And say a student normally by their age would be a fourth grader, but they're only performing at the third grade level. And you know, picking up on what Mayor Bloomberg said over lunch about getting rid of social promotion, reassigning them back to the third grade so then if they make a year's worth of progress, they're on target and they are proficient because they've made a year's worth of progress rather than if you classify them as a fourth grader and they make a year's worth of progress, they're a failure. Aside from the political pushback that that would cause, which would be enormous, there's a practical problem which I continue to worry about is how long it takes us to get the results. So if you tested kids at the beginning of the year, at least in a state like mine, you wouldn't have the results just because it takes that long to grade the tests and for three, four, five months. And at that point, you're in a very different position. That's why we actually use the year-end test as the benchmark for social promotion. Commissioner in Florida. Uh, 
the same comment. I, I, th I think uh, the, the other element of it is just you know, the, the uh, level of, of precision that we have in, in uh, the, the, the testing industry uh, today. We've got to be careful that we don't overestimate what, what, what value they bring to, to our work. And so, again, I think we have to keep, keep our sights on, on some good judgment about that, that as well. We have time, I believe, for one more question. Okay. Hi, Steve Bowen, the Maine Heritage Policy Center. One of the uh, accountability approaches that's <clears throat> been getting a lot of attention recently is pay for performance for teachers, building principals, uh, merit pay, whatever phrase you want to use, alternative compensation systems. Uh, we've been looking at that as, a, as an organization. We'd like to propose uh, an approach for our state to start looking at that. And I know proposals in, I believe, all three of your states have, have uh, put some variation of that model into place. What, what, are, what are the aspects of a good model of a performance-based uh, pay system? What are the elements that we should have? Some, we've looked at the national literature. Some models are seen as being very successful, some not quite so much. Uh, what would you suggest? We're looking for performance-based, tying performance to teacher pay in some way. What should we do? What should we not do? Uh, we, we've spent a fair amount of time here in Florida working on that issue in, in a couple of diff different iterations, and uh, I think you know, we're, we're, we're still working hard at developing what we think is going to be a, an ultimately a successful plan. Uh, there are a lot of questions, kind of a checklist I think you have to kind of go through. You have, it is, are you talking about individual performance pay? Are you talking about team performance pay? If so, how do you define it? Uh, and how do you measure it? And uh, when you uh, 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 get into the, the uh, as we are here in Florida with our, our performance pay program, where uh, you're, you're paying uh, uh, for successful teaching in a variety of subject areas, the, the whole, the whole uh, array of subject areas uh, that uh, you know, the business of, of developing assessments uh, and the comparability of those assessments becomes a, 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 an issue for you. Uh, we've we've uh, found a successful way to, you know, to address that here in Florida, at least for the, for the present uh, time, but are looking for better ways of, of doing that. And uh, again, so I think uh, there are a number of, of uh, issues that uh, need to be addressed in, in, in a performance pay strategy. There, there certainly are other issues that, that we wrestle with. There, there are outcome measures, uh, such as assessments on, on exams, uh, that are fairly straightforward. There, uh, and we do a variety of those here. We do it for performance on our FCAT uh, results, our state accountability results for team performance. Uh, we do it for AP performance on advanced placement exams. We do it uh, for uh, 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 teachers on individual subject areas through our uh, merit award program for, for, for pay for performance uh, uh, this year. Uh, we also pay uh, performance for, for process measures, such as uh, uh, national board certification awards, such as uh, and, and traditional, more traditional uh, work, such as master's degree and doctor, doctor is all a, a process kind of uh, performance pay uh, strategy, time, years of experience, as, as it, and it can even be calculated into that. And, so again, I think uh, the challenges are defining what what you want to value, and and then how you're going to how you're going to measure it and assess it, and whether those are the kind of, part of it. The accountability and performance pay; these kind of issues are are, are part uh, ways of, of measuring uh, output, but but and, and rewarding output. But there are also uh, issues of, of of culture and social factors w within within the organizations that you manage and, and lead. And so uh, part of these decisions, I think, rest in what kind of a culture do you want to build within your schools? What kind of incentives do you want to build within that? And how do you want people to work together uh, within those buildings? Or do you uh, choose other options? Uh, and so all those, I think, are some decision points that didn't give you any answers. There's lots of questions. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think there's so little of what's called merit pay out there that it's, it's really, we're, we're still learning because we're in the earliest years. Uh, from my experience, I, I think there are a couple of key points, and actually one of them I even surprised myself on. The first point, I think, is uh, keep it simple. And, and for me, simple is two schools that start in the same place, one gets significantly different results from the other, or if you do it on an individual basis, 
two teachers. I mean, so it's apples to apples, transparent. Then the, the difficulty or the ease of the test does not become outcome determinative. The second thing that, that I've come to believe is that school-based merit pay, going precisely to what Eric's talking about, the culture. I want everybody, the unit that matters in education is school. Parents don't then send their kids to a district. They don't send them to a teacher. They send them to a school. And I want everybody in that boat to think they've got to paddle together. And in his speech, I often quote from Shanker, he, he nails it exactly, is if there's really meaningful merit pay and I'm the slacker, the school, the teachers will take care of me. And I also want them to, to be supporting me, training me, mentoring me. I want everybody pulling together and understanding that the success of a building turns on how all 500 kids in that building turn, not just those kids in my math class. Okay, and Dan, any, Governor, any final words? All right, well with that, I'd like to uh, thank the panel for an outstanding and stimulating session. Thank you.